Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final seminar of the iBank seminar series before the big meeting. Uh, so just a reminder that abstracts are due on Friday, but if you're here, you probably already know that. Um, also, uh, note that for next year, we still have some open slots. So if you all have recommendations for speakers, please send them our way. Um, for today's uh, final seminar, we're going out with a bang, going out with an eye bangs, uh, because uh, we have uh, Dr. Amelie Baud here uh, to tell us about her recent work. Dr. Baud is on the faculty at the Center for Genomic Regulation in, in Barcelona, uh, where she works on the genetic basis of complex traits, generally speaking. Uh, before that, she got her bachelor's degree in biology and master's degree in bioinformatics at uh, the Ecole Normale Supérieure, uh, or ENS, in Paris in 2009. After that, she moved to the UK and got her PhD with Richard Mott and Jonathan Flint at Oxford in, in 2013. Then she did uh, two postdocs, uh, the first with Oliver Stegel and Cornelius Gross at the European Bioinformatics Institute, and then uh, the second with Abraham Palmer at UCD, so much further away for that one. Um, and uh, when she was at UC, UCSD, that's where I first uh, met her. Um, she's been at uh, the CGR in Barcelona since October of 2021, so not uh, not too long, but she seems to be going uh, full steam already, perhaps. Uh, she asked me to send her some samples already, so um, uh, 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 she's already getting some work done. I can, I can verify that. <laughs> um, uh, during uh, her time, she's been consistently productive, producing several nice publications on behavioral genetics. Uh, <laughs> a nature genetics paper looking at locus heterogeneity and identifying several candidate genes involved in anxiety and other traits related to things like heart disease and MS. Uh, recently, she's been particularly focused on studying indirect genetic effects. Um, for example, she's been looking at social genetic effects, which is really, uh, I think, an overlooked dimension of of biomedical genetics. Uh, I think she's going to be talking about that today. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure though, but she has demonstrated that genotypes of cage mates uh, has enough uh, has a broad effect on uh, a number of biomedical uh, phenotypes, including things like anxiety um, and other medical related traits. She also studies the microbiome, which is conceptually related to social genetic effects. Um, but I don't want to say too much more because I think she's going to be talking about that today as well. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, That's right. I guess yeah. at, at this point, I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, uh, just to say thank you so much for speaking today. Um, and uh, we're all great to have you and take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot. Paul. So yes, I'll, I'll be talking a bit about um, all of this. And I, you know, I give um, the title of this talk as the genetic ecosystem of behavior, and I'll try to sort of uh, convey what, what that means to me and why I see not only social partners, but also gut microbiome as coming together. Um, so I'm assuming you can see the slides all right and that you can hear me well, if not, let me know. Uh, but so... Yeah, I'll just go through that uh, sort of a schematic here, which is not very good looking. That's all I was able to come up with. It's the sort of logo of my lab now, and uh, it really um, represents what I see as the genetic ecosystem of behavior and, and other uh, phenotypes, I have to say. But for today, I focused on uh, behavioral and, and neural traits. Um, and so, it all starts with this relationship here between what I call focal individuals and social partners. And so I started working on these uh, indirect genetic effects. I'll, I'll you know, define this very uh, soon. 
uh, some time ago, but really I think the paper that is uh, that has been most influ influential here on that subject is uh, The Nature of Nurture by Ogi Kong and colleagues uh, that used um, uh, familial data from Iceland to show that the genotypes of parents um, influence the phenotypes of the children, not only through the genes that are inherited, but also through the environment that the parents create for their children. And they focused on uh, educational attainment largely. Um, but, but I think now this concept is out there uh, that the genotypes of social partners, be they uh, you know, related like parents and children or unrelated, um, uh, can influence uh, phenotypes and behavior as much as the genotypes of the focal individuals. And so now focal individuals and gut microbiome, well, this is a very, very you know, dynamic um, area of research with quite a lot of research uh, on it already. And you know, when we think about behavior and neural phenotypes, it's referred to as the gut brain axis. Um, and uh, you know, John Cryan, for example, has put forward a holobiont perspective uh, which is to say that there is not only the individual but also the microbiome forming sort of a team and you know uh, contributing to to behavior with uh, with effects in both directions uh, actually. And now you might be wondering why uh, social partners and gut microbiome are related and and that goes uh, in my mind at least uh, through a local prophagy, which is a behavior, a natural behavior of uh, lab rodents. Uh, whereby one mouse eats uh, feces from a cage mate, for example, um, and through that uh, bacteria from one mouse get ingested by the other mouse with subsequent um, possible effects on, on behavior. So I'll come back to that. I just wanted to sort of uh, give you an idea of what I mean by the genetic ecosystem of behavior. So I will uh, focus on uh, the component between focal individuals and social partners uh, first, because this is where uh, most of my uh, research has taken place um, so far. So we have two words for those indirect or social genetic effects, okay? And, and here I sort of uh, formally define them. So let's say that we have a phenotype of interest, which is measured in so-called uh, focal individuals. Um, this phenotype of interest can be influenced by genotype or genome type, as Rob Williams like uh, to call that, of social partners. Uh, and again, these could be family members or cage mates, for example, in mice. And this relationship here, which is an indirect genetic effect, is not magical. You know, it goes through some traits of the social partners that are genetically influenced and that go on to influence. Uh, the focal individuals. What's important here is that in, in all of the, the, um, the approaches that I'll describe today, we don't know, we don't need to know in advance what those traits are. We don't need to know what the traits mediating IG are. And actually one of the goals of my research is to try to uncover uh, what these traits are, how are indirect genetic effects mediated. And so if we talk about indirect genetic effects, it's useful to also introduce direct genetic effects, which are the classical genetic effects that we think about. Uh, and so you can see how the phenotype of a focal individual is influenced not only by its own genotype or genome type, but also the genotypes of social partners. So in humans, there's uh, been some, some research already uh, on indirect genetic effects. It started you know, pretty much at the same time as I was uh, starting to uh, work on, uh, on, on this subject in laboratory rodents, but actually there had been a lot of research previously in the fields of animal breeding and evolutionary biology. So this is not a new thing. It, it's been around for, for a long time, but in different uh, scientific communities. In humans, there is evidence of Ig from mothers on early life traits of the children. Um, and, and also some evidence of Ig from parents on phenotypes that are uh, expressed later in life. There's also uh, limited evidence of Ig between uh, schoolmates and also between spouses. But, but the last two are really um, not researched as much as the parental genetic effects. 
Now, studying Ig in humans uh, is really, really difficult, and for uh, two main reasons. Uh, one of them is population structure, which is um, you know the fact that uh, individuals that uh, tend to live in uh, a similar area tend to also be gen more genetically related than individuals living far away, and 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 so there's sort of a link also between genetics and environment, and that's really hard to disentangle in human uh, genetic studies. And thinking about indirect genetic effects in particular, there's an additional difficulty, which is that um, partners, for example, if you think about couples, do not choose each other at random. And so it is hard to distinguish between non-random partner choice and social influence later one happens you know at the moment when the uh the the individuals get together and one happens later on but without longitudinal data it's really hard to actually distinguish between the two uh, in humans and so there's still a very big debate about um whether there is evidence of ig in humans uh or not so i think you know for all these reasons and and all the reasons that uh, you are familiar with uh, laboratory rodents are a very good models, and in particular because they do not uh, choose their cage mates. So I've been um, working on indirect, indirect genetic effects in laboratory rodents, both mice and rats. Um, and, and again, what I mean by that is uh, focusing on Ig between cage mates. And so the first experiment that uh, I did when I started in this field uh, was done in collaboration with Megan Mulligan, who's here, I think, and, and Rob Williams and, and the lab over there. Uh, and, you know, I wanted a simple design with two inbred strains to begin with. And the design that I uh, chose was the following. It used, sorry, um, so two inbred strains of mice, uh, DBA and, and B6, also because they're the founders of the BXD panel. Um, and in total, we used 86 unrelated male mice. By unrelated, I mean uh, that mice that were together in a cage didn't, were not from the same litter or family. Um, and, and I really feel bad about using males only at the time. I, I would not do that again. So the mice were housed in pairs from weaning on uh, in different combinations, as you can see here, either uh, a DBA mouse with a DBA mouse or a DBA mouse with a black six mouse or two black six mice together. And of course we had replicates to be able to do statistics on this. And so we put them together at weaning and we left them alone largely uh, for six weeks. And during that time, they had time to influence each other. And after that, we started phenotyping them and and uh, trying to model indirect genetic effects to see if we could detect any evidence of indirect genetic effects. So I'll show you here the, the most significant result, uh, which is not for our behavior, but it's uh, for a phenotype, the phenotype ear wound healing, uh, which works in the following way. So just before the mice were paired, we do an ear punch in the ear of the mice and then we pair the mice, we let them interact, and then uh, at sacrifice, we measure the size of the hole, which gives us a measure of uh, the rate of wound healing, which, you know, there's debate whether this is really wound healing or cartilage regeneration. Uh, but anyway, it's the result that was most significant, and, and I'm very confident about this one because I've seen it come again for that phenotype in two other data sets. So this wound healing phenotype is definitely uh, affected by indirect genetic effects in, in many uh, populations. And so just to illustrate how we model and, and quantify indirect genetic effects, here I'm plotting the area of the hole, or you know, which is inversely correlated to the rate of healing. And I uh, split the mice into four groups. This group is for black six focal mice that were housed with a black six cage mate. I don't know if you see my pointer. Maybe I should, uh, can you see the pointer or? Yeah, we can see your pointer. We can, okay, that's great. So yeah, this first group on the left is black six focal mice with a black six cage mate. The second group is uh, black six focal mice with a D2 cage mate, okay? Third group is D2 focal mice with a black six cage mate. And fourth group is D2 focal mice with a D2 cage mate. And so if we, first of all, focus on the, you know, two groups 
to the left, these are all B6 mice that were phenotyped. So there's no direct genetic effects here. All mice have the same uh, genome type. The only difference is the strain of their cage mate. It's uh, black, six, black six here and, D, and D2 here. And so, you know, this difference here was uh, nominally significant, definitely. Uh, after correcting for the number of phenotypes we tested, it was uh, not significant, but it, it did suggest an effect of wound healing, which again, I've observed in now two other data sets. Uh, and in contrast, we, we saw no effect at all in D2 mice, suggesting that there's actually an interaction between um, direct and indirect genetic effects, or in other words, an interaction between the strain of the focal animal and the strain of the cage meat. And you know, at the time, uh, I had this speculative mechanism to uh, explain how such effects could arise, which was that the strain of the cage mate influences the rate of allo grooming by the cage mate. Uh, and allo grooming comes to, you know, there's maybe a mechanical disruption of the wound, or on the contrary, the saliva helps uh, wound healing. And so that is how it could affect wound healing in focal mice. So after this sort of pilot experiment, um, I started using outbred data sets uh, to quantify and study indirect, indirect genetic effects. So outbred data sets, uh, each animal is genetically unique as well as phenotypically unique. And that's you know, what is shown here. And so in that case, if we consider uh, this mouse here or this rat here, uh, the genotypes of this mouse influence the mouse's own behavior, okay? These are direct genetic effects, but they also influence potentially the behavior of the gray mouse and the white mouse, and these are the indirect genetic effects. So in these populations, in this uh, experimental design, uh, each uh, mouse sort of expresses direct and indirect genetic effects, and we can't, you know, just compare groups as before. Uh, instead, we use a more sort of advanced uh, modeling technique, which uses linear mixed models, uh, for example, to calculate heritability. Um, so I've used now two outbred mouse data sets uh, in which I have quantified uh, and studied indirect genetic effects. So both of them for now are in mice. One of them is the heterogeneous stock population that Jonathan Flint uh, studied a very long time ago, and the other one is the CFW population that uh, his group studied more recently. In both cases, uh, there are many, many uh, behavioral measures. <coughs> yeah, I hear um, some, some sound. If anyone wants to ask a question, by the way, um, feel free to do so anytime. Feel free to interrupt. <coughs> um, but so we have many different behaviors. And of course, sorry, my presentation is on a timer for some reason, that's very annoying. Um, so depending on the data set, we have either, uh, you know, four to six mice per cage or, or a set number of three mice per cage. In one data set, the, the animals in a cage were related in some cases. And in the other data set, all the animals were unrelated. We had thousands of individuals, you know, very hundreds of cages, which is actually like the relevant measure of sample size here. Um, so two very different data sets with, which had advantages and disadvantages for the different analyses that I did. So I've, I wanted to show you here the results of quantifying aggregate indirect genetic effects on focusing on neuronal and behavioral phenotypes. And this first table is in the outbred HS mice. So the sort of older data set where uh, mice were related to some extent. Um, and you can see that there were like a number of measures, behavioral measures that were uh, collected as well as uh, a measure of neuronal, um, of adult uh, neurogenesis, sorry. Um, and so I've here, I'm here showing only the measures that are significantly affected by uh, indirect genetic effects at a false discovery rate of 5%. So the cutoff is on this column here, the Q value, which is the FDR. Um, all these measures are affected by uh, Ig at, at this 5% threshold. And then I'm showing here the proportion of variance that is explained by indirect genetic effects and direct genetic effects. So using a variance partitioning approach, we can really sort of assign 
phenotypic uh, variants and covariance to IgE and DGE. Um, and I'm showing this here. You should know that, for example, you should probably notice that, for example, so this one, the variance is two and you know there's a big standard error. So you wouldn't expect the p-value to be uh, significant here. The reason why it is actually significant and small is because the p-value uh, test whether um, the phenotype is affected by not only Ig but also the covariance between Ig and Dg, uh, which I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, so it's no mistake that this is positive and this is still small with a, with a rather large uh, standard error. This really means that these phenotypes are affected by Ig and their covariance with Dg, uh, but you can see that um, you know the variance explained by Ig is quite small. But in some cases, you know, 15% of phenotypic variance being affected, or 9% of phenotypic variance uh, here being affected uh, for uh, fear potentiated startle is quite um, well, quite uh, large in terms of uh, variance. In the other data sets, the unrelated CLW mice. Uh, there was only evidence of IgE on uh, four swim test mobility. Okay, and so I used the sort of same threshold here, but I did add this value, which is below the threshold. But you know, these are the two measures that we can get from the four swim test, and both of them really, you know, suggest that there are indirect genetic effects um, on this uh, phenotype. Um, and the variance here again is quite large and you can see that it's actually comparable to that explained by direct genetic effects. So, so these are just not, you know, um, mild effects. Sometimes they are actually quite common and in some cases they can be really large. Um, and so Marie, as I, yeah. Do you mind if we interrupt you? No, 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 please uh, do. We have one hand raised, uh, is, right. is there a question? Yes, I'll may ask the question. Yes, please. It was just about uh, the number of mice. I see numbers like 1,500 to 2,000. What, what do you mean That's with right. this? This is so the number this, of subjects. This is the number of mice that were phenotyped, correct? This is the number of mice that were studied. So these are data sets that were collected usually by a sort of consortium or large team. And they included one to 2,000 individuals and each animal was phenotyped for a very large number of phenotypes. And, and this is the kind of number that we need uh, when, we, uh, when we want to study genetic effects in, in these outbred populations. Okay, did, did you show effect sizes of these um, variables? Because I suppose that uh, if you have so high number of uh, observations, effect size might be minuscule. That's right. So I wanted to actually uh, use that time to remove the, sorry, the um, timing on my, uh, on my slides. I, uh, if you give me just a second to do this and I'll come back to the effect sizes. Um, rehearse timings, no record, sorry. Okay, I apologize for having interrupted you. I, no, no, I no, couldn't no. believe it's... you have this, you know. We, we uh, work no, I, I'm actually normally. just <laughs> taking the opportunity, but I don't think I'll manage. So I will uh, just go back to um, my slides and, and um, answer your question. I apologize with this sort of technical uh, issue. So, Yes, so these are the, the effect sizes you're talking about, you're asking about. This is the proportion of phenotypic variance that uh, is explained by these indirect genetic effects. So uh, obviously it goes up to 100, okay? And for example, for startle, these two measures of startle, we see that indirect genetic effects explain, uh, you know, around 10 to 15% of phenotypic variance. And in comparison, uh, direct genetic effects, the classical genetic effects that you know everyone studies, explain probably uh, more uh, closely to 25%. So the comparison tells you that uh, indirect genetic effects are not minuscule in some cases. In, in many cases, they are really small. Um, so overall, if you want across all behavior, behavioral measures, they are um, weaker than direct genetic effects, but in some cases, they they are very important. And, and that is also the case for, for swim test immobility here. 
Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Amelie. Uh, Anna was asking about the Q value. Yes. Um, uh, associated with us. Do, do... So the Q value is like uh, is the false discovery. So usually when we when we use uh, the false discovery rate, we apply a cutoff, right? Like five percent. Yeah. And so five percent is zero point zero five, and so the cutoff that I applied is zero point zero five on the Q value. The Q value tells you what would the false discovery rate be if the cutoff, the p-value cutoff, what was equal to that. So, so basically, for uh, false discovery rate controlled at five percent, uh, we require the Q value to be smaller than 0.05. Great, thank you. Um. Right, so as I mentioned in my first slides, we don't need to know how the, the indirect genetic effects are mediated, what their mechanisms are to be able to detect them. We just look at the association between genotypes of the cage mates and phenotype of the FOCO individuals. Uh, but we are interested in knowing that we want to know. And, and, and so I'm developing sort of methods to uh, you know, use genetic analyses to answer that question. And there are several ways to go about it. The first one uh, is to uh, investigate phenotypic contagion. So phenotypic contagion is something like, I am stressed and therefore I, I, uh, you know, my stress is contagious and, and my partner uh, gets stressed as well. Or it's very um, well known that in humans, for example, smoking is contagious. Uh, uh, I quote, you know, quoting, it's not, uh, it's not like a, um, disease contagion, but phenotypic contagion, we call that. Um, and with, uh, so I, I didn't get into the sort of uh, mathematical details of the mo models that I use, but one of the parameters that uh, we estimate when we uh, fit those linear mixed models is uh, rho here. Rho is the correlation between direct genetic effects and indirect genetic effects. And if the mechanisms of indirect genetic effects as are as simple as I'm stressed, so you're stressed, then we expect rho to be equal to one, okay? And I, and I did test that using you know, statistical testing and I did show with p-values that rho is different from one for many phenotypes in CFW mice, including for the FST immobility measures that I showed to you uh, previously. And so what this means is that there are genes that, um, that uh, actually there are genes of uh, one mouse, the cage mate, that influence the phenotype of the focal mouse, but that do not influence the phenotype of the cage mate itself. So it is not as simple as I'm stressed, you're stressed. Contagion is not sufficient to account for indirect genetic effects. Um, even though that is the mechanism that everyone thinks about, uh, you know, at first. And so, with this demonstration, which I'm not sort of uh, explaining in details here, the next question was, well, what are the genes then, and also the traits of cage mates that mediate indirect genetic effects? And for geneticists, uh, you know, one sort of uh, immediate way to, to get to that is to run uh, the genome-wide association study, but here I will be talking of the genome-wide association study of indirect genetic effects and not direct genetic effects. So in, in this you know, uh, approach, we again relate the phenotype of, a, of the focal individuals to the genotypes of the cage mates. And so I'll uh, show you what I found here for the IgG was of immobility during the four swim test, which again is one of the measures uh, significantly affected by IgEs in CFW mice and for which I've shown that phenotypic contagion is not sufficient uh, to explain the IgE. So when I run the GWAS, and again, we find like a suitable genome-wide significant threshold, there is one locus here on chromosome one that was particularly um, interesting. Uh, the main reason is because this locus uh, is a chromatin domain meaning that uh, the, there are potentially uh, genomic interaction within the domain, but it's essentially isolated from the rest of the genome. And in that chromatin domain, uh, there was only one protein coding gene, which was EPHA4. 
Uh, and so that is sort of a best case scenario for GWAS because usually it's really hard to know when you have a locus, what are the variants, what are the genes that are causing the association. Um, and here, the presence of only EPHA4 in the chromatin domain means that it's really very likely that EPHA4 is the gene causing the indirect genetic effects on four swim test um, immobility. And so to sort of test, oh yeah, so I should say that there's also a suggestive association of this locus with uh, the ear wound healing phenotype that I'm really interested in because this is the one phenotype that I always found, found to be uh, significantly affected by indirect genetic effects. And so to sort of uh, test or validate both uh, effects here, I um, carried a follow-up experiment again with inbred strains of mice, well, with a knockout strain uh, more precisely. So here is the design of the experiment. In that experiment, the focal mice are FVB inbred mice. And uh, this genetic background was chosen because it's the one that is closest to uh, the CFW outbred background that I use for GWAS. And in that setup, the cage mates are EPHA4 mice, either wild type or heterozygote. The, the, the knockouts do not usually survive until weaning. So we had to work with wild types and heads only. Yeah. And so the design is similar to what I did, you know, uh, some time ago with Megan and Rob. Uh, the mice were paired at weaning. And, and again, I did the ear punch to be able to look at wound healing later on. Uh, we let the mice interact freely for two months. During that time, they had time to influence each other. And after two months of co-housing, we run the mice in the four swim test, as well as measured the size of the holes. And so the, the results of, the, um, of these experiments are the following. I'm showing the results for, for swim test immobility here and the results for wound healing uh, here. Uh, so if we have to talk about p-values, you know, they're both sort of around 0.05, I'm not, uh, this one would con be considered significant, this one not, but really it's, it's quite comparable, right? Um, and so uh, again, here we have uh, two groups for the males and two groups for the females. All these mice are FVB mice, so there's no direct genetic effects here. Only FVB mice were phenotyped in that case. What differs between the groups, in addition to the sex, is the genotype at EPHA4 of the cage mate. So this group were FVB mice with a wild type cage mate. This group were FVB mice with a heterozygote um, knockout cage mate. Okay, and every time we have uh, wild type here and het, wild type het, wild type het, and so this difference here is. Uh, suggestive, significative, whatever. Uh, and um, what, what we see here is that uh, this is uh, true in males in that case. And, and it turns out that it was a terrible choice to choose FVB as a focal mice because uh, FVB mice have a very low level of immobility in the four swim test. And you know this is my mistake because I'm uh, mostly a geneticist and not a behavioralist. And I did not know that in advance, but so I think that because they uh, are so, their immobility levels in females, especially are so low, this really prevented us from uh, finding um, indirect genetic effects in females. So I'm repeating this, uh, this whole experiment, but uh, actually uh, investigating several different other inbred strains as focal mice. And for wound healing, you know, there was uh, what's now usually called a significant result in males again, uh, whereby the, the rate of healing of FVB mice depended on the genotype at EPHA4 of the cage mates. So this is uh, some degree of validation of what we obtain in the GWAS. And again, I'll be repeating this and expanding on this uh, in my lab now. Uh, now, what is the sort of mechanism that uh, we hypothesize based on this finding? Uh, it is the following for wound healing. So the idea is that the EPHA4 genotype of the cage mate, which is HET or wild type, influences allogrooming, either just the propensity of the cage mate for allogrooming, or perhaps actually the abundance of EPHA4 in the saliva of the cage mates. 
And in either case, you know, both cases, when the cage mate uh, does the other grooming, licks the ear of the focal mice, then uh, the saliva of the cage mate comes to influence the rate of uh, healing of the focal mouse. Okay. So it goes from genotype of cage mate through allogrooming or saliva to uh, healing of the focal mouse. Uh, and again, here we're carrying um, sort of additional experiments now to see whether there is indeed a difference uh, of EPHA4 in the saliva of the head mice. Uh, and also we will be looking at allogrooming. Now for, for a swim test, uh, we'd love to know how can, you know, the genotype of the EPHA4 mice influence the, the focal mice. Um, I don't know, um, well, I suspect, you know, the, it's through behavioral interactions, but I don't know which ones. And what we have done, what we did at the time already is to video record the pairs of mice over a period of 24 hours. Um, and, and through a collaboration with Vivek Kumari, I'm hoping to be able to uh, quantify the different uh, types of social interactions that can um, happen between the cage mates and to better understand uh, which kind of interaction is uh, mediating these indirect genetic effects on, on, immobili on immobility, sorry. Um, all right, so I, I actually don't have my phone. Um, Paul, could you tell me um, how much time I have, please? You have uh, 20 minutes. It's 12.39 right now. Great. Um, so I guess uh, I'll move a bit faster on, on this second part of the talk because so far most of my research has been on indirect genetic effects, but I, I in my lab now are like full gear on the microbiome. Um, and so I have to start this, you know, uh, discussion of uh, gut brain axis by uh, <laughs> this very annoying slide. Uh, correlation does not mean causation. And, you know, it's uh, every time I read news article uh, suggesting that the microbiome causally affects phenotypes of the host, I, I always see the caveat that mostly it's a correlation that was uh, usually detected and, and it's turned into a causal effect without, you know, um, the necessary statistical or other evidence. So correlation is when the two are correlated. What we are interested in is causal effects of the microbe, of the microbiome on the host phenotype, but it could be that it's actually going the other way around. We call that reverse causation. For example, when uh, the host develops a disease, it's um, quite likely that this can go on to influence the microbiome. And then there is also confounding, which is very likely confounding from environmental factors that independently affect uh, the microbiome and uh, the host phenotype. And so I'm, I'm uh, developing sort of approaches to be able to do causal inference to understand from these correlations, which uh, you know, causal paths are actually at play. And to do that, I use principles of genetic epidemiology uh, which is to say that we use host genotypes as anchors to be able to sort of draw these arrows from host genotype to gut microbiome to host phenotype. And with that, uh, because the host genotype cannot be affected by the host phenotype, right? It's set at birth. Uh, if we find this, we avoid reverse causation. And also in many cases, we can make sure that the host genotype is uncorrelated with uh, environmental confounding factors. So can, we can greatly limit uh, confounding effects. Although of course it's, it is possible that actually host genotype affects both gut microbiome and host phenotype uh, independently. And this we cannot rule out. This is pleiotropy and it's um, both quite likely and, and difficult to uh, sort of distinguish from true causal effects of the gut microbiome on host phenotypes. So to carry out uh, this work, I am just extremely uh, fortunate to uh, have collaborators in the, uh, so officially called NIDA Center for GWAS in Outbred Rats, uh, which I, I usually call the P50. So the P50 has many of its members, uh, I think on, on this um, seminar today, and it's uh, sort of spearheaded by Abraham Palmer, where I did my um, second postdoc. Uh, and so the P50 have um, studied the first 
five years at least, uh, studied 5,000 rats, which were all uh, phenotyped for many measures uh, relevant to um, substance use disorders, but also metabolic traits and, and you know, other bone related traits and so on and so forth. Uh, and all the rats were also uh, genotypes with the goal of uh, carrying out the genome wide association study of direct genetic effects. And so I've been uh, sort of reusing these data together with data uh, on the microbiome collected in collaboration with the Center for Microbiome Innovation at uh, UCSD. And, and so the data set is really amazing. These are outbred rats this time, okay, uh, not mice anymore. Uh, and so, as I was saying, 5,000 of them have genotypes and phenotypes. A large subset has uh, data on the sequel microbiome collected using 16S data. And then a smaller subset has uh, shallow shotgun sequencing of the sequel microbiome and also metabolome data. So far, uh, I've focused on the analysis of the 16S data. So this is what I'll show over the next few slides. Well, sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of, you know, what we find in this data set without uh, all the details. What's important to know is that the rats were initially bred at uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, and then they were shipped to three different centers for phenotyping. Uh, the University of Michigan, the University of Buffalo, and the University of Tennessee. And in Tennessee, there are rats that were phenotyped for their behavior, but we also have a subset of breeders for which we have microbiomes. And then uh, genotypes, microbiome, and metabolome were uh, obtained at UCSD. So first of all, as is well known in the microbiome field, rats that are bred or maintained in different locations, even different buildings, have just different microbiomes, right? Uh, there's a very strong effect of the environment here. And so for me, that means that essentially I've been analyzing each of the four studies uh, separately, but having the opportunity to see if the findings replicate between the studies. So it's pretty amazing. We have the opportunity to find things that do replicate in up to four different um, you know, locations. And that really means that if we find that, it's very likely that it would replicate again if we were to do the experiment again in a fifth location, like for a follow-up. So um, to do this genetic epidemiology and eventually try to find causal effects of the microbiome on the host, the first step is to uh, detect host genetic effects on the microbiome. And there is a whole you know, debate about whether host genetic effects actually influence the microbiome. The short answer is uh, they do if, if the environment is controlled, they do, but, but at a low level. And so in humans, for example, it's very hard to detect. But in, in these outbred rats, we do detect very clear evidence that host genetic effects as a whole, so it's like the you know, heritability, uh, that these microbial taxa are heritable. And there is very clear evidence in three studies and in the one with the smaller sample size there's no evidence. So yes, microbial taxa are heritable, but in terms of magnitude, uh, the heritability is, is small. And this data set is great to be able to compare the heritability of microbial taxa with the heritability of uh, host phenotypes. And here I split between behavioral phenotypes in orange and non-behavioral phenotypes in red. So this plot shows the heritability, the number, okay, the proportion of traits with a, in a given heritability bin. This is 5%, 10%, and so on. And what we can see here is that the behavioral and organismal phenotypes have you know, pretty high heritabilities, behavior less so, as we know. But then the, microbial, the microbial traits are even less heritable. So yes, they are heritable. Yes, they are affected by host uh, genotypes, but the magnitude of these effects is, is quite small. So this was for aggregate effects across, like the sum of all effects across the genome, but we're really interested in finding local effects, which loci in the genome influence the microbiome, because this is what we'll be able to leverage to do causal inference, okay? And so I'm showing you here a beautiful example of a locus on chromosome 10 that is associated with uh, the abundance of paraprevotella in all four studies, in New York, Michigan, Tennessee behavior, and Tennessee breeder. So there's no doubt that this locus 
influences for our Provotella. Uh, and actually, it's really interesting. Can we use that locus to try to see if we detect evidence of causal effects from the microbiome on the host? Are there any phenotypes mapping to that locus? There is one. Um, fasting glucose also significantly maps to the same locus. Okay, It's significant in what we call phenome-wide association study. But then I carried out mediation analysis, uh, and I'm still new to this. I'm not saying it's 100% uh, correct, but I think so at this point. And there was no evidence that paraprevotella uh, causally influences fasting glucose. And actually, there was no evidence of um, a causal effect the other way around. And I've actually done that across dozens of loci now. And, and these are loci where there is evidence that the locus influences both the gut microbiome and the host phenotype. But it seems to be the case that uh, these effects are independent. So it is effectively pleiotropy with no evidence that causal effects, that, cause, that micro, the microbiome causes um, host genetic effect, uh, host, sorry, uh, causally influences the host phenotype. Um, so this is where I am at the moment. I do see host genetic effects affecting microbiome and host phenotypes, but very little evidence of causal effects between the, the last two. So I, I have very little time to talk about the next steps, but we're trying to improve the detection of host genetic effects on gut microbiome, because this is the first step for genetic epidemiology. Uh, and we are working to use the shallow shotgun sequencing data that, that we have to do so. Felipe uh, is a PhD in my group who's working on this. And as part of this, we'll create uh, a, re a resource which will be an HSRAT specific reference catalog of microbial genomes. So some of you might be interested in this. Um, and so finally, I'll, say, I'll have just one slide to sort of uh, explain this last relationship between social partners and microbiome. Uh, what is the role of allocoprophagy in mediating Ig? This is how I basically came to uh, focus on the microbiome. I started with Ig, and then everyone was asking me, so are these Ig mediating by, uh, you know, the microbiome? And it could be the case going this way. So genetic variants in cage mates influence gut microbiome composition in cage mates. And then through a local prophagy, uh, these microbes get transferred literally to the focal individuals. And in the focal individuals, they go on to influence behavior. And so if you draw this arrow from here to here, these are indirect genetic effects on, on behavior. Uh, and so I, I, I'm going to dedicate a, a good amount of effort in the coming years to study bacterial transfers like this one through uh, a local prophagy and actually allo grooming could also lead to transfer of bacteria and so this is something that uh, my lab is now really interested in so i'll finish here uh, and acknowledge all my amazing collaborators uh, starting with uh, you know collaborators uh, back at the ebi in cambridge megan and rob and you know their lab were uh, for the first experiment i ever did on igs uh, Abe Palmer and his lab, um, you know, who sort of really helped me uh, set up this new area of research on the, on the microbiome. Uh, and Amanda, who was involved in the, the experiment, the validation experiment on EPHA4. These are the collaborators from the Center for Microbiome Innovation. Neely also did the experiment with me uh, at UCSD on EPHA4, and she's now joined my lab. Uh, and these are the members of my lab now. Uh, so thanks to all my collaborators. And then I'm really excited to see, I hope many of you soon, um, at the mini meeting organized by IBANGS at, the, at uh, FENS uh, in July. So I'll be uh, giving a, a talk there and I, I really hope to meet um, people in person there. I, I really look forward to it. I'm very happy to you know, take any questions. I can <coughs> go back to my slides. Um, if need be. Thanks, Amelie. I'll, I'll clap on everyone's behalf. Um, so uh, if folks have a question, you can raise your hand. Like I see Leah has her hand up um, or you can put the question in the chat or you could just unmute yourself. So it's a, a, uh, all methods of asking questions are accepted here. Um, 
I guess we'll start with uh, Leah, Leah Solberg Woods, who has her hand up. Go ahead, Leah. Can you guys hear me? I'm moving over closer to the microphone. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yes. that's great. Okay, great. So wonderful talk, Amelie. I really find your work extremely fascinating. I wanted to ask, you showed the indirect genetic effects for wound healing, which was very clear, and also for several behaviors, including forced swim test. Did you look at other physiological traits? Um, and, and, and not like, like, of course, I'm interested in obesity, body weight, fat pad size. Um, did you, did yes. you see it there? Did you look for it? Yes, so I, I did. Uh, I didn't include it in, in this presentation because I wanted to focus on behavior, uh, but I did. And so if you want to look at the results for real, they are you know, in supplementary tables of um, the plus, bio, uh, plus genetics and genome biology papers. And yes, we did find uh, indirect genetic effects on other physiological uh, measures. Uh, in the HS mice, the top ones were immune measures. Perhaps not surprisingly, we found very strong and significant indirect genetic effects on, uh, on, measure, on immune measures. And actually, in that case, they were stronger than direct genetic effects. Uh, and yes, we found them on also, you know, blood biochemistry measures, um, uh, on body weight in some cases as well, and so on and so forth. So yes, we did find some. Uh, sometimes, you know, higher than behavior, and, and all of them are sort of uh, detailed in the supplementary uh, tables. I can okay. look yeah. at some specific ones if you want. No, I'll go take a look. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Leah. Other questions for Dr. Bob? Yeah, I mean, great talk. Uh, so when you do your GWAS on the indirect effect, uh, what happens when you have like three animals in the same cage? Yes, the way I have modeled things so far is by saying that cage mates have an additive effect. And so, uh, you know, at any given locus, uh, one cage mate, for example, can be zero, one, or two, the other cage mate can be zero, one, or two. And so we model the sum of these genotypes uh, saying that effectively it's additive genetic effects, not only across alleles, but also across cage mates. And this is how we, we model IGs. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Other questions? I have one sort of curiosity question about your mediation analysis. I just don't know that much about it. Uh, so I'm wondering if you just sort of talk to me, you know, school me on how that works conceptually. Okay, okay conceptually, I, I, I uh, probably can, and, but no, I would not school you on that. <laughs> I'm and, still educating myself on the, on the, on the issue. And, and whether um, that has been effective for you at finding, I, I know you said you didn't identify a mediation pathway with your traits, but have you used it to identify mediators for any other traits? No, never. This is the first time I run this analysis. I, so, okay, so let me tell you uh, briefly how I run it, at least how I think it works. Um, so the idea is that um, we have traits A, well, okay, so let's see, <clears throat> host genotype, microbiome, and host phenotype. We want to know if the microbiome mediates the effect of the host genotype on the host phenotype, right? And so basically we say, uh, we, we have a model where we, we test the association between host genotype and host phenotype. And then we have a model where we, uh, where we account for microbiome, like we fit microbiome as a covariate. And if the microbiome is really mediating host genotype to host phenotype, then once we account for the host microbiome, we should not detect the effect of host genotype and host phenotype anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's the sort of a correct theory. I, I have a meeting plan with an expert friend. Very soon, I have lots of questions. Um, I just assume that this would, uh, you know, work and find things that I find nothing. So I've done all the, you know, sort of uh, basic checks on my code and stuff and so on. Like, for example, if I, if I, if I account for, um, for the genotypes at a nearby SNP, of course, I, I, 
I see an effect as expected, but, but that is just sort of a technical check. Um, and I know Leah and I have had questions about uh, mediation analysis before, and uh, that's where I am at the moment. Thank you. I imagine it must be effective at, you know, like looking at the relationship between an expression, QTL, and, you know, if you've identified a candidate gene, you think it's mediated by differences in expression of that gene. Yeah. That's so with, with CCQTLs, it's, it's a bit different, though, because CCQTL, you know, genes that are nearby each other, if they have a CCQTL, then all of them are sort of going to be tagging each other because yeah. of linkage disequilibrium. Uh, so, so in that situation, there are sort of there's another caveat which um, which I don't have here. I see. But, and that complicates uh, the mediation analysis. But yeah, we, we have found that it is successful for CCQTLs because because genes are driven potentially by, by different loci, right? So you're gonna have, um, I guess, we have been able to identify a loci that has a handful of genes with CCQTLs. Mm -hmm. And we, we put them each through mediation analysis the way that Amelie described. And many of them don't, don't change the significance level and, and only one will. So, um, we, we have yeah. taken that as evidence that that, that gene is yeah. likely mediating it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, th thank you, that, that helps. Uh, I'm not used to thinking about that, but that's, that's great. Thanks, Leah. If anyone has experienced, uh, well, so Leah, I, I guess maybe, I have a note to schedule a meeting with you. I think I said. Oh, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't I would do it love. Emily, Will, Will, I would really recommend Will Valdar, right? He's done yeah. all our statistics. Yeah. I'm, I just uh, try to understand it. <laughs> You're too long. Yeah, it would be, it would be great to talk more about this. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk at, at the theoretical yeah. level, but don't bring yeah. the math models in with me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Um, well, it's one o'clock exactly. So I think this might be the first time that we could actually finish on time. Um, Thanks so I wanna, much. I want to end uh, just by applauding again for uh, Dr. Vaughn. And uh, just to say thank you, that was a great talk. Um, and thank you for ending our seminar series this uh, this academic year with um, uh, with such a great talk. Um, and Thanks, Owen, for the questions. It's great to see familiar faces and new faces as well. I hope I'll get to meet many of you soon. And hopefully we'll all see each other either at Fens or or at iBangs uh, mm -hmm. in person. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, let's, let's end it there. Um, I'll, I'll... Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> hey, <Megan. laughs> we'll talk soon, too. Bye-bye. <laughs>